Hey, this is Ash from All Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hints and tips in dentistry. Well, today is something I've been wanting to talk about for years, actually, and finally a case is presented. I'm going to talk about one of these. Now, if you don't know what this is about, hold tight because I'm going to show you. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to hold hold suspense. We're going to use some irrigation. We're going to use a couple of heads, you know, head stream file as well. We're going to get into that real quick. Anyways, this case presented to a clinician for... The diagnosis was necrotic with symptomatic apical peritonitis. MB2 was found. If you're wondering, that was a problem. We, On the initial PA, it was really hard to see this lesion, but it's pretty hard to see the lesion still. Obviously, a combing was, is more ideal. Um, but in emergency exam, the diagnosis was made and the pulpectomy was completed. All four canals are clean in shape and good to go. Well, the patient presented four days later and this friend shows up. So now we have a palatal abscess. So our diagnosis changed. All the teeth are all the same, all vital, except for this tooth here, this first molar. So the diagnosis now is previously initiated with a, an acute apical abscess. So one of the things we're going to do, and I was trained in my residency, is not all, not IND, well, you will, a little bit of IND, but first aspirate this lesion because you don't know what this is. You don't know if this is granulomatous, you don't know if this is just swelling um, or some sort of suppuration pus in there, or potentially hemorrhagic. So we're going to make sure that before we make an incision and drainage, and then the question I have for you, and I put it in the description box below, do you need to IND? It's a great article that came out a few years ago in the Journal of Endodontics that talks about not needing an IND, and their study shows that it doesn't make a difference, actually. And if you clean and shape your tooth adequately, now we're going to talk about adequately in a second here, if you clean and shape the tooth that's causing the problem adequately, there might not be a need for incision and drainage. And furthermore, it actually is more, it's higher morbidity, meaning it causes a patient more grief to have that incision and drainage. Anyways, let's go ahead and let's address this tooth here. I'm not going to go through the video. We're just going to talk about one of the things that, that matters and I think is important. Thank you so much for making it to this point in the video. And I just wanted to introduce this course we have. It's called Root Canal like an Enodontist, and it really the idea behind it is to bring together all the things I've talked about for years and put them in a really a systematic, easy place to access all this information. It's fairly affordable. It's intended so it doesn't break the bank and gives you some basic ideas and some advanced ideas on how to tackle root canals because I'm telling you, I know what it's like to be stuck in a root canal. I know what it's like not to get down a canal, and I'll sure as hell tell you, I know what it's like to block out and ledge. And I'm going to provide you some tricks and tips, practical stuff that's going to get you down the canal and get out of there and have a successful root canal. It's really, the idea is to learn those secrets that endodontists use them every day. Now, as well as the course, I put together a, a private Facebook page where we can learn together from all our mistakes. So, you know, I really, it'd be great for you to join us. You have to purchase a course to access a private Facebook group. So go ahead and take a look. Take Check us out at allthingsendo.ca. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Anyways, back to the show. So when we take a look at this periodic radiograph, we know that there might be a lesion. It probably is. Maybe there's some resorption. Or, you know, our palatal canal is going to be large. So I just want to address that right now. When you're trying to get your working length on large canals, what I highly recommend, and this is what we did, the clinician... We talked, sat, I took a look at the case during the procedure. And what I did was immediately, I'm gonna take a really large file and I'm gonna get established my working length because using a 10 file on a palatal canal, you might actually go long because the, the file is so small. For example, let's use this. I'm just thinking quickly. So if this is your portal of exit and this is, pretend this is your 10 file, you know, it's gonna, you're not going to get much resistance. You're not going to get a, a, a really strong reading as compared to a smaller canal with, a, you know, with this is your 10 file still, your smaller canal, you're going to get a much cleaner, much more accurate reading. The problem with these large, so pretend this is a palatal canal. The problem is you got to send your file further out the canal, further out. So meaning this is a portal of exit. This is into the soft tissue or into the osseous tissue. You got to send your file further out to finally get a decent reading. Hopefully that's clear on that. So what we did and we found actually that on this palatal canal is actually a millimeter shorter 
by using a larger file rather than just a 10 file. So I just want to take a second and clarify what exactly I was talking about, if you're not clear. So what we're really aiming for, in my experience, I know Dominica Rucucci talks about just going up to the blue. Especially in necrotic teeth, I like to go to one red bar. It kind of it tells me that I'm touching the PDL. So if this is our palatal canal, it could be a it could be a distal canal in a, in a mandibular molar, or it could be just a large canal in the anterior teeth. I find that commonly, especially with retreats, that the, the canal is just treated too small. That's a, another long. That's another discussion. But we've got a large. Pretend this is say a 60. If you were to take a file, you would gauge it'd be like 60. So you take your 10 file, which is this, and you you know you go to where the apical constriction actually is, or if you know where the PDL starts. But because the file is so small, it doesn't really give a reading. And there's talk about this resistance and whatnot, specific resistance in the apex locator. I'm not an expert on it. If you are, go ahead and put it in the comments below. I just know how to use it. You know, it's not going to read one red bar. It's actually going to read something maybe even like up to here. If you were at a 10 file, this size of canal, and you're going to be reading here. We all know what that is. You're kind of like, oh, I'm not far enough. So you kind of watch one or just place it because there's no not a lot of resistance. You keep going further and further down outside the canal and finally you get to one red bar. Now in this, this case, it actually was reading 18.5 when the clinician uh, did this. And it's like, okay. And uh, my experience, you know, I sat down just to double check the working length. I was like, okay, well, let's, I'm going to just take a 40. It was just a random file. I like the 40 size. I made a headstrom because then I can remove some debris, apical debris. I take that in and and this isn't about like, oh, I know best. It's like, it's just been so much experience in doing this. When I bring it to, it was at 17 and a half, it'd be 17. So this was 18.5 with the 10 file. It really was 17.5 with the larger file. And that's where I got one red bar. So that's really what it is. It's using a larger file to get a better, more accurate reading in these really large canals. And I think it's really important because then it, it, it decreases the amount of time you spend wasting trying to figure out working length because it becomes so random. Because what will ultimately happen if you don't take a large file, you know, if you're doing root canals routinely, you should have a, a set of larger hand files just to get even just working length. You can use your rotary files as well to, to do that. But what will happen is that you'll clean and shape large. You actually won't even clean and shape anything. You'll just run the file down. You can see how large this canal is and you'll May hopefully you won't be irrigating into the soft tissue um, because you know that can be problematic. But then as well, when you go to fit your cone, pretend you know now pretend this is your cone. You know it's it's going to be hard to see if it's long, but it actually probably will be long. Anyways, hopefully that helps. Back to the back to the series. So what does that do? Well, it it keeps us it allows us to gauge better the apical the length. Obviously the length. But then what I did was I took this headstrom file. So I use the headstrom as for the working length as well. And what it allows us to do there, I've got a couple videos talking about headstrom files. You know, it allows us to file, sorry, my hands are dry. Maybe I should be using gloves, sorry, but I can't do this with, like I say, it allows us to file. So what I did was we bent it just a little bit, just a hair, a little bit, not that much. Turn my unidirectional stop towards the buckle. Now this is, I'm gonna place this file in towards the buckle, for example, like this, this is a tooth here. Place it towards the buckle because palatal canals curve towards the buckle. And I'm going to get to my working length. It was like 17, for example, let's predict that 17. And then I'm going to gently debride. So I'm gently gonna pull, let's pretend here. Oh, we'll use this. We're going to gently pull at that apical portion. I'm gonna gently file. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this to the apical portion and make sure that all that debris, because you know it's one thing, it's one thing just to go in there with another primary and clean the shape and hope for the best. It's another to be a little more exacting in your technique using a file that's a little bit larger. And then we're just gonna debride and to file, that's what I'm trying to say, file that apical third, especially where the apical constriction is, and make sure and we get all that necrotic debris because it was a large canal. So there was a little bit of necrotic debris that came out, you can see it under the scope. And then what we did, so we did that a few times, but not only is filing important, but also mechanical or chemical chemo disinfection. So fortunately in this case, I was able to take this. This is just a BC sealer tip and we're gonna practice using negative irrigation. And it's really simple. I bent it to my working length. Sometimes these don't fit. So you can use a smaller, use a smaller tip. 
this worked in this situation. So I bent it at my working length. I placed that into the palatal canal and I had dental assistant place a suction tip on here. So imagine that's down the palatal canal. I place our suction tip and then we take our irrigating syringe. This is not it, but just pretend we had our irrigating syringe. I'm going to place that into the tooth and we're going to run hypochlorite continuously, especially through that palatal canal. Run, run, run. We ran about 10 mils through that in a negative irrigation fashion. And the reason why I like this when we have these types of situations is that it's very safe. It's a large canal and we don't want to, we, the last thing we want to do is send sodium hypochlorite out the apex in any situation, especially these types. Um, so using negative irrigation, we're able to run a lot of full strength hypochlorite, clean out, you know, make sure we rinse out that apical third. That's the most important part in, it, well, it is, but it, the whole tooth is important, but you know, we're trying to get rid of that necrotic debris. And as well, the suction tip going down there actually is helping remove any of that necrotic tissue as well that we're not able to, you know, touch with our file. The last thing I love about using negative pressure in this situation is that if I, if this does go out the end of the tooth, for example, or it gets constricted, the suctioning stops. So you know immediately that you're not going to be taking sodium hypochlorite out the, out the end of the apex. So it's a very safe way. So it prevents sodium, it reduces the number of times you have a potential, reduces potential for sodium hypochlorite incident. You're getting negative pressure, you're getting suction, you're getting lots of hypochloric go through the tooth. Anyways, blah, blah, blah. So last thing is what we did was we're going to, before we, so we seal up the place calcium hydroxide, seal the tooth up. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to aspirate this lesion. There's lots of ways to do it. Uh, these are blunt tips, so this is not actually the tip you wanna use, but it's this is an 18 gauge. These are, so the key things you wanna have are this being sterile, this tip is sterilizable, so and it's also malleable, so you can bend it. That's not that important, but what's really important is it being sterile. So you don't want to take bacteria when you're aspirating this lesion and place bacteria back in it from another source. So we want to make sure that this is sterile, and because these are the tips that we have, I made a small little incision right on the mucosa, just a little, actually, on the, on the second photograph we have, you can see here, this is, this is when the patient returned. So you can see there's a reduction. I made a little incision here, and then what I used was just this tip, just to see if I can go in underneath the mucosa just a little bit to see if I can pull back and irrigate or aspirate any type of, especially hemorrhage. We don't want to get into some sort of um, blood-based lesion that would be not, or vascular lesion. That's the word I'm looking for. So, but you know, interestingly enough, there was no pus in here. There was, let's go back to this, a better picture. There was no separation, there's no pus, there's no um, vascular lesion, there's no nothing. It was just that typical cellulitis. And so what we did was I uh, placed a bit of pressure, see if I can get any type of pus. You know, we spent a few minutes. Um, I didn't make a large incision, just that little one. Was not able to aspirate anything. So that was it. So we sealed up the patient and then upon the patient's return, See if we have it here. Let's go zoom back out. We have the starting of healing. So the patient was returned, patient was reappointed 24 hours later, and you can see we definitely have some healing. So the patient's pain has gone from 10 out of 10 to one out of 10 on the tooth, which we expect and actually hope for. It was great not to expect it, but to hope for. It. And then slowly we're gonna get resolution of this lesion. Anyways. Aspiration is a really important part, especially these large ones, just to make sure you don't get into a vascular lesion. That's the word I've been looking for since the start of the video, I'm sorry, but hopefully that's helpful. There are different tips you can get. You can get lots of different tips, especially for ones that have the, t the a pointy, uh, pointy spot, pointy tip on it, so you can get into that without having to do this. But the benefit of this, I guess the benefit of this type of tip is that it's more of a blunt kind of dissection to make it into wherever there might be some pus. Anyways, take a look at the article I've included in the description box below. It's very interesting and it actually has changed the way I approach these types of lesions. So as always, thank you so much for joining me to this point. I'm grateful for your time and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.